from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Accenture Tech Vision 2020. Brought to you by Accenture. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at the Accenture San Francisco Innovation Hub on the 33rd floor of the Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco. It's 2020, the year we know everything with the benefit of hindsight. And what better way to kick off the year than to have the Accenture Tech Vision uh, reveal, which is happening later tonight. So we're really happy to have one of the authors who's really driving the whole thing. He's Michael Biltz, the Managing Director of the Accenture Tech Vision. 2020, a very special edition. Michael, great to see you. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely, so you've been doing this for a while. I think we heard earlier this thing's been going on for 20 years. It is. Um, you've been involved for at least the last eight. I so think a little bit more than more that. More than that. Yeah. So what's the uh, what's kind of the big theme before we get into some of the individual yeah, items? So, so I mean, I think right now what we're really talking about is that our real big theme is this we the digital people. You know, and it's that recognition that says that we've fundamentally changed. I mean, you know, when you start looking at yourself and your lives is that you've gotten to a point where you're letting your cell phone track you. You know, your car knows where you are probably better than your spouse does. You know, you're handing your key to all, you know, to Amazon and Walmart so they can deliver packages and your help. And more than that is that actually we're trying to start to, you know, revolve our lives around this technology. You know, I look at my own life, you know, and we just sold our second car, you know, specifically because we know that Uber and Lyft exist to fill that void. Right. Well, you don't have to look much further than than phone numbers. How many people remember anybody's phone number anymore, right? Because you don't really have to. And it, I think it's the 15th anniversary of Google Maps yep. uh, this year. And, and to think of a world without Google Maps without that kind of instant access to knowledge is, is really hard to even fathom. But as you said, we're making trade-offs when we use all these services. And, yep. and now some of the, the costs of those things are being maybe more exposed, um, maybe more acute or in your face. I don't know, yeah. what would you say? I mean, I think what's happening now is, is that what we're realizing is that it's changed our relationship with companies. Is that suddenly we've actually brought them into our lives. And on one hand, they're offering and have the ability to offer services that you could never really do before. You know, but on the other hand, is that if I'm going to let somebody in my life, suddenly they don't have to provide, just provide me value in this is useful, is that they actually are, people are expecting them to retain their values too. You know, so how you know they protect your data, what they're good for the community, for the environment, you know, for society, you know, whether it's sustainable or not, is that suddenly, whereas people used to only care about what the product you're getting, you know, now how it's built and how your company is being run is starting, like it's just starting, right. you know, to become important too. Right. Well, it's funny because you used to talk about you know kind of triple bottom line, you know, shareholders, customers, and and your employees, and you talked about really kind of this fourth line, which is yeah. the community and really being involved in the community, people care. Suddenly you go to conferences where we spend a lot of time and you know all the utensils are now yeah. uh, compostable and the forks are compostable and you know a lot of the individual packaging stuff is going yeah. away. So people do care. They do and, there, and there's a fourth and a fifth that says the your community cares, you know, but it's also your partners do too. Is that you can't you know, I'm going to say downgrade, you know, the idea that your B2B folks care is that suddenly we're finding ourselves tied to these other companies and not just in a supply chain, you know, but from everything. And so you're not in this alone in terms of how you're delivering these things, but now it's becoming a matter that says the, well, man, you know, if my partners are going to get pummeled because they're not doing the right thing or they don't have that broad scope, is the that's going to reflect on me too. And so now you're suddenly in this interesting position where, all of the things that we suspected were going to happen around digital connecting everybody is just starting to, and I think that's going to have a lot of positive effects. Yeah, so one of the things you talked about earlier today, in an earlier presentation, was, was kind of the shift from kind of buyer and seller, seller and consumer, to provider and collaborator, really yep. kind of reflecting a very different kind of a relationship between the parties as opposed to kind of this one, one shot transactional uh, relationship. No, and, and that's right, and it doesn't matter who you're talking about, is, is that you know, if you're hiring folks you know, for skills that you're assuming that they're going to learn, you know, that's going to be different in three years and five years, you're essentially partnering with them in order to take all of you on a journey. You know, when you start talking about you know, governments is that you're now partnering with regulators. You, know, you look at companies like Tesla you know, who are working on you know, regulations for electric cars, they're working on you know, regulations around you know, battery technology, and you see that 
this go it alone approach isn't what you're doing, you know, rather it's becoming much more holistic. Right, so we're in the innovation hub and I think number five of the five is really about innovation it DNA is. and you guys are driving innovation. And you know, uh, rest in peace, Clayton Christensen passed away Innovator's Dilemma, yep. my all time favorite book. But the thing I love about that book is that smart people making sound decisions based on business logic and taking care of existing customers will always miss this continuous change. But you guys are really trying to help big companies be innovative. What are some of the things that they that they should be thinking about besides obviously engaging with uh, Mary and the team here at the yeah, Innovation no. Hub? And that's the really interesting thing is, is that you know when we talked about innovation you know five or even ten years ago, you were talking about just how do I find a new product or a new service to bring to market, and now that's the minimum stakes. Like that's what everybody's doing, and I think what we're realizing as we're seeing tech become such a big part is that. We all see how it's affecting the world, and a lot of times the things are good is that there's no reason why you, know, you wouldn't look at somebody like a Lyft or Uber and say that it's had a lot of positive effects, but from the same standpoint is that you, know, you ask questions of, is it good for public transit? Is it good for city infrastructure? And those are hard questions to ask, and I think where we're really pushing now is that question that says, We've got an entire generation of not tech companies, but every company that's about to get into this innovation game. And what we want them to do is to look at this not the way that the tech folks did that says here's one service or one technology, but rather look at it holistically that says how am I actually going to implement this and what are the real effects that it's going to have on all of these different aspects. Right, law of unintended consequences is always, always a is. good one. I remember hearing years ago this concept of, of curb management. I'm yep. like, curb management, who ever thought of that? Well, drive up and down in Manhattan when they're delivering groceries, they're delivering yep. Amazon packages and, and FedEx packages and, and Uber Eats and, and no, right. delivery dog food. Now, where's that stuff being staged? You know, Now the warehouse has kind of shifted yep. out into the public space. So you never kind of really know where these things are, are going to end up. No, and, and I'm not saying that we're going to be able to predict all of it. I think rather it's that starting point that says that, you know, we're starting to see a big push, you know, that says that these things need to be factored in and considered. And then similarly, it's the, if you're working with them up front, it becomes less of a fault, you know, a fight of whose fault it is at the end. And it becomes more of a collaboration that says the, how much more can we do if we're working with our cities, if we're working with our employees, right. you know, if we're working with our customers. Now another follow up, you guys have been talking about this for years is, you know, every company is, is, a, is a tech company or a yep. digital company, depending on how you want to spin that. But as, as you were talking about earlier today, in doing so and in converting from products to service and converting from an mm -hmm. ongoing relationship, to a one-time transaction. It's not only at that point of, of, of uh, touch with the customer, but you've got to make a bunch of fundamental changes back in your own systems to support um, kind of this changing business model. Now, and, and that's right, and I, and I think this is going to become the big challenge of the generation, you know, is that we've gotten to a point where just using their existing models for, you know, how you interact with your customers, or how you protect their data, or who owns the data. You know, all of these types of things is that they were designed back when we were doing single applications and they were loading up on your Windows you know, PC. And where we're at now is that we're starting to ask questions that says, all right, in this new world, what do I have to fundamentally do differently? You know, and you know, sometimes that can be you know as simple as asking a question that says, you know, there's a, a consortium of, you know, pharma folks who have created a joint way for them to develop all of their search algorithms for new drugs, but they're using blockchain, and so they're not actually sharing the data. So they do all the good things, but they're pushing that. But fundamentally, that's a different way to think about it. You're, you're now creating an entirely new infrastructure because what you're used to is just handing somebody the data and what they do with the data afterwards you know, is kind of their issue and not yours. And so now we're asking big new questions to do it. Right, another big thing that keeps coming up over and over is trust. And, and again, we talked a little earlier, but I, I find this really ironic um, situation where people don't necessarily trust the companies in terms of the people running the companies and what they're going to do with their data, but they fundamentally trust the technology coming out of the gate and this expectation of, of course it works, everything works on my, 
on my mobile phone. But the two are, yeah. you know, related but not equal. No, I mean, they're not. I mean, it, and, and it's really pushing this idea that says the, we've been looking at all of these, I'm going to say, scary headlines, you know, of people not trusting companies for the last number of years, while at the same time, the adoption for the technology has been huge. So there's this dichotomy, you know, that's going on in people, where at one point is the, they like the tech. You know, I think the last stat I saw, you know, is that everybody spends, you know, up to six and a half hours a day involved, you know, on the internet, you know, in their technology, you know, but from the same standpoint <clears throat> is that they worry about who's using it and how and what it's going to be done. And I think where we're at is that interesting piece that says the, we're not worried about a tech lash. We don't think that people are going to stop using te you know, technology. Rather, we think it's really this tech clash you know, that says the, they're not getting the value that they thought out of it, you know, or they're seeing companies that may be using this technology that don't share the same values that they do. And really what we think this becomes is the next opportunity for the next generations of service providers in order to fill that gap. Right. Yeah, don't forget, there was a Friendster and a MySpace before there was a Facebook. Yeah, there so was. nothing uh, lasts yep. forever. So last question before I let you go is sure. busy night. The first one was the eye and experience. And yep. I think, you know, the, the kind of the user experience doesn't get enough um, light as to such a such a defining thing that does move the market. If Again, I love to pick yep. on Uber, right? But the Uber experience compared to walking outside on a rainy day in Manhattan and hoping to hail down a cab is fundamentally different. And I would argue it's, yep. it's that technology put together in this user experience that defined this kind of game-changing event as opposed to, you know, it's a bunch of API stitching stuff together in the back. No, that, that's right. And I think where we're at right now is that we're about to see the next leap beyond that. Is that, you know, most of the time when we look at the experiences that we're doing today, they're one way. Is that people assume that, yeah, I have your data, I'm trying to customize and whether it's a ad or a buying experience or whatever, but they're pushing it as this one-way street. And when we talk about, you know, putting the eye back in experience, you know, it's that question of the next step to really get people both more engaged, as well as to, I'm going to say, improve the experience itself, means that it's going to become a partnership. So you're actually going to start looking for input back and forth, you know, and it's sometimes it's going to be as simple as saying that that ad that they're pushing out is for a product that I've already bought. Or, you know, maybe even just tell me how you knew, you know, that that's what I was looking for. But it's sometimes that little things the back and forth is how you take something from, you know, which can be a mediocre experience, even potentially a negative one, and really turn it into something that people like. Yeah. Well, Michael, I'll let you go. I know you got a busy night. We're going to present this. And uh, really thanks to you and the team. And congratulations for coming up with something that's a little bit more provocative than cloud is going to be big, or mobile's going to be big, or edge is going to be big. So this is great material, and uh, and thanks for having us back. Look forward to tonight. Well, ha happy, to, happy to do it, and you know, you know, next year we'll probably do it again. I don't. Know, we already know everything. It's 2020. <laughs> what else is not uh, known? Everything's <laughs> going to change. All right. Thanks again. He's Michael, I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE. We're at the San Francisco Innovation Hub at Accenture's headquarters on the 33rd floor, high above San Francisco. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.